you don't mind, remain standing. You may stand a little bit longer today than normal, but we are going to have the privilege of dedicating Genevieve. So if the family would come forward and stand in the middle aisle here. <laughs> Genevieve Renee Travers was born on January 29th, 2014. She weighed four pounds, ten ounces. Little thing. And she was born into a very difficult situation. But within weeks, God connected her with the Thomas family. They, they've been doing uh, this for many years, connecting, taking care of kids. Uh, and she came as a, a baby, and they fell in love with her. And the picture you see on the left up there is uh, one day Lee was out, uh, and he saw this little dress, and he said uh, he believed God to give her uh, uh, that little girl as a daughter. And so he bought the dress in faith. He took a picture of it there. And last Monday, they adopted Genevieve. So now they... So now her last name is Thomas, and they have quite a crew now. A few weeks ago, I dedicated her cousin, Gracie, and that dedication tied in with the sermon, kind of like Genevieve's does today. And I, I like to read just a page out of Max Lucada's book, Grace. He said, adopted children are chosen children. That's not the case with biological children. When the doctor handed Max Lucado to Jack Lucado, my dad had no exit option, no loophole, no choice. He couldn't give me back to the doctor and ask for a better looking or smarter son. The hospital made him take me home. But if you were, if you were adopted, your parents chose you. Surprise pregnancies happened, but surprise adoptions? Never heard of one. Your parents could have picked a different gender, color, or ancestry, but they selected you. They wanted you in their family. You object, oh, but if they could have seen the rest of my life, they might have changed their minds. My point exactly. God saw our entire lives from beginning to end, birth to hearse, and in spite of what he saw, he was still convinced to, quote, adopt us into his own family by bringing us unto himself through Christ Jesus. And this gave him great pleasure, Ephesians 1 and 5. We can now live, quote, like God's very own children, adopted into his family, calling him Father, dear Father. And since we are his children, we will share his treasures for everything God gives to his son Christ is ours too, Romans 8, 15 and 17. It's really simple. To accept God's grace is to accept God's offer to be adopted into his family. Your identity is not in your possessions, talents, tattoos, kudos, or accomplishments. You are defined by, you are not defined rather, by your divorce, your deficiencies, debt, or dumb choices. You are God's child you get to call him Papa. You, quote, may approach God with freedom and confidence, Ephesians 3.12, and receive the blessings of his special love and provision, and you will inherit the riches of Christ and reign with him forever. The adoption is horizontal as well as ver vertical. You're included in the forever family. Dividing walls of hostility are broken down, and community is created on the basis of a common father, instant family worldwide. Rather than conjure up reasons to feel good about yourselves, Trust God's verdict. If God loves you, you must be worth loving. If he wants to have you in his kingdom, then you must be worth having. God's grace invites you, no, requires you to change your attitude about yourself and take sides with God against your feelings of rejection. I want to counsel the Thomases about something they already know. They already have many children. But tell Genevieve often, like you do tell your children that Jesus loves her and that you love her. And show her how much you love her by holding her accountable and by just holding her and ultimately by introducing her to Jesus Christ. God will be an anchor in her life and, and your introduction that you make her to God is going to be the greatest gift that you can give her. She's wanting to She's wanting to be a part of this here. Uh, 
we're, we're so glad that God worked all this out. And if you'll pray with me, uh, I'm going to first pray for her. And then as my wife takes her, I'm going to pray for her family. And then we're going to let her go get rid of her energy in class because she's got plenty of it. So Genevieve, can I hold you for a minute? Can you come to me? We're going to pray for you, okay? Is that all right if we pray for you? See all these people? They're going to pray for you. They're happy that you're part of the Thomas family now, all right? So I'm going to move over here by mom so you don't get too worried here. And let's all pray for Genevieve right now. Thank you, God, for Genevieve. Thank you for working it out for her to be a part of the Thomas family, Lord. I pray your blessing on her that you keep her and protect her, Lord. That you be with her in times of trouble. That you be with her in her times of decision. That you would let her be aware of you at an early age, God. And that ultimately you would help her to find her way to you. That you would draw her to you. That she might have a relationship with you, God. We, we dedicate her to you for the times we cannot be with her. You can always watch over her. You can always take care of her when we cannot, God. I pray your blessing on her in Jesus' precious name. I pray for the Thomas family, Lord, that you would help them as they lead all of their children into relationship with you. I pray you'd provide for them in every way, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, financially, in every way, God. Give them wisdom. Let your love flow freely in their home. Lord, I pray for the entire family, for every grandparent and every, everyone who's connected, aunts and uncles, that you would bless them, Lord, that you would bless this entire family in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's give God a round of applause for what he's done. Here. Thank you. You may move back to your seats. This is the second child they've adopted. Mikey was a similar situation, and God worked it out there, too. This is today going to be my third sermon in a series of probably three or uh, four or five sermons on trust and confidence and hope. I'm going to describe someone that you're all probably familiar with. She was beautiful. She was world famous. She was an actress and a singer, a sex symbol, in great demand. She probably made more money than the president, to whom many people believe she was a mistress. Some of her biographies say that her faith in her last six years was Jewish, but for most of her life she was Pentecostal. She had everything, including three husbands. But nothing that she had could she really count on. Her name was Marilyn Monroe, and she overdosed at 36 years old. On her record, it says probable suicide. That's a familiar storyline. It seems to happen again and again, especially to the people who have everything that we think we could feel more comfortable if we had. If I just had a better job, if I just had a little bit of recognition, if I could just sing real good, if I just was more beautiful, all the things that she had, we kind of, we know better at one level, but at another level, we, we trust in those things. Our money says in God we trust. But I'm here to ask you a tough question this morning. Do we really trust in God? Do I really trust in God? My text is a little long, so I had you be seated before I read it. Uh, I'm asking you today, are you a believer or are you an idolater? When I talk about idolatry, we usually think of totem poles and people who set things on shelves and bow down before those kind of things. But in America, our idolatry looks a little bit different. And all of us are subject to it if we're not careful. What you trust is your God. If your ultimate trust is not in the one true and living God, then you at times are probably committing idolatry. Now, it's only human to try to find something to trust in. We, we, we want to try to find our bearings. If we have a, a, a rough upbringing, we try to latch on to something that defines us and something that's sturdy, something that we can hang on to. 
And so people hang on to a lot of things. And let me just mention a few things that can become idols. You may not have thought of them before as idols, but uh, beauty can be idolatry. Uh, you know, nobody likes me, so I'm going to put on a pretty face, and I can trust that. That'll make me worthwhile. Or some people find philosophies. They'll, they'll go through a dozen different religions, and they're looking for something that they can trust in. They're not looking for God. They're looking for something that they can think about that helps them feel good. They're not really having a relationship with God. They're having a relationship with the philosophy about a God. And that's why America has bought into the totally ignoramus, I can't, I can't say it strong enough, the totally ridiculous thought that whatever God is to you is God. That's about as ridiculous, and it's about as irrational as you can get. And I'm going to address that this morning. We can grab on to revenge and live for revenge. We can live angry. Some people, that's, what, that's how they get their bearing. Their God is anger. Their God is, one of these days I'm going to prove to everybody. One of these days everyone's going to know that they, they find uh, connections with people or, or maybe they go after degrees and some people go after degree and then they get another one and another one. It's not enough because they think if I could just have enough initials behind my name, then I, it's going to make me feel good. That's idolatry. They're looking for something that can take care of that way down deep inside. Now, the problem is many things you can grab onto, but they'll only last for a little while. You can get a new car and after you feel good about life, right? But then you notice a little ding because you were in the parking lot and someone wasn't careful with their door and it's like my, my car is not new anymore and it's not as shiny as it used to be. And, and uh, your life can change in a heartbeat. Uh, our, our family changed this last year uh, when our only son moved away. Suddenly we have no family here again. Uh, Becky can tell you about how in just a split second she was driving down the street completely healthy and someone who had been drinking hit her head on. And the next day, or a few hours later, we were in the hospital. She was flat out of it, near death. She was hooked up to all kinds of tubes, just, just like that. If she had been trusting her faith, if she had been feeling good about life because she had a vehicle, if she'd been feeling good about life because she could walk without pain, then that could have all been taken away from her, just like that. In just a moment, her life changes. Those of us who are maybe not rich, many of us call ourselves poor and we're the richest people in the world, but we're poor compared to some other people. And many of us will say, I, I trust God, I don't trust money. But just let that little bit of money you do have run out and you'll see how much you trust God and not trust money. Life has a way of squeezing the truth out of you. We often change God's little g. America, honestly, America, can you say in God we trust? I don't think we should take it off our dollars, but probably we're lying. Really, we should probably say in money we trust, or in power we trust, or in politics we trust, or in science we trust, or a lot of other things. But America as a nation does not trust God anymore. We've gotten so untrusting that our political leaders will tell the world that we're not Christians anymore. Those of us who love God and we think we trust Him will oftentimes be sent on a little excursion through the woods so God can show us where we maybe don't trust Him like we could. Here's the deal. God invites you into this awesome relationship where he's God and you're not. And if you'll trust him, you can be a part of this kingdom that's going to go on forever and ever and ever. And you can live with him in complete bliss. And, and there's going to be no more tears and all that kind of stuff. But you've got to trust him first. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. I have to believe in heaven before I ever see it. I have to believe in heaven before I ever get there. I've got a lot of things right here on earth. I've got a thousand things I can handle and trust. And one thing 
that I don't see that I need to trust. I've got thousands of people. I can go from relationship to relationship. I can marry 16 different people and, and go after them for love. And, and I, I can handle them. I can, I can get infatuated with them. They can be beautiful. I can go out to dinner with them. But, but God, he's, he, he's unseen. And he's hard to really get my handle on sometimes. And so I tend toward idolatry. Your girlfriend can be your idol. So God spoke to his people through a prophet, and he, he was really almost in a way making fun of how silly it is for us to have idols. So I'm going to read this passage, and don't be mad at me because this is God talking. I'm, I'm going to read it from Isaiah chapter 44, and I'm going to read it from New Living Translation because I want you to get a feel for it. We're not studying this, uh, uh, picking it apart so much as I want you just to feel how silly it is to have an idol. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of heaven's armies. I am the first and last. There is no other God who's like me. There's not lots of gods. There's not, you can't make up gods. There's only one God who's like me. Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes to you long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? Everyone answered that. No, there's no other rock, not one. How foolish are those who manufacture idols. Now he's going to make fun of them a little bit here. These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this, so they're all put to shame. But who but a fool would make his own God? Would you ask that question with me again? Who but a fool would make his own God? An idol that cannot help him one bit. All who worship idols will be disgraced along with all these craftsmen, near, mere humans, who claim they can make a God. They may all stand together, but they'll all stand in terror and shame. The blacksmith stands at his forge to make a sharp tool pounding and shaping it with all his might. His work makes him hungry and weak. It makes him thirsty and faint. Then the woodcarver measures a block of wood and draws a pattern on it. He works with the chisel and plane and carves it into a human figure. He gives it human beauty and, and puts it in a little shrine. He cuts down cedars. He selects the cypress and the oak. He plants the pine in the forest to be nourished by the rain. Then he can use part of the wood to make a fire. With it, he warms himself and bakes his bread. Then, yes, it's true. He takes the rest of it and makes himself a god to worship. He makes an idol and bows down in front of it. He burns part of it on the tree to roast his meat and keeps himself warm. He says, ah, the fire feels good. Then he takes what's left and he makes his god, a carved idol. He falls down in front of it, worshiping and praying to it. Rescue me, he says. You're my God. Such stupidity and ignorance. Their eyes are closed. They cannot see. Their minds are shut. They cannot think. The person who made the idol never stops to reflect. Why, it's just a block of wood. I burned half of it for heat and used it to make my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a God? Should I bow down to worship a piece of wood? The poor deluded fool feeds on ashes. He trusts something that can't help him at all. Yet he cannot bring himself to ask, is this idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? Now before we laugh with God at the foolishness of the tree, I want you to ask yourself, are you trusting in something that cannot help you at all? I know people who have trusted in chemicals, nicotine, alcohol. They got caught and it's the only way they can make it through. They're, they're trusting in, in that chemical reaction in their body. And all it does is it, 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 it kills them little by little. It, it kills their lungs or it, it kills their brain cells or it ruins their family. But they can't. They can't seem to let go of that and turn to an almighty God. It's really weird how 
how we would even have trouble making that choice. But I'm in the same category. Before I know it, I'm trusting in things that can't really help me at all. The enemy, when he wants to take you out, he goes for the juggler. Let me warn you about one of the most powerful things. Last night I, I, I told people in the prayer meeting that one of the most powerful weapons the enemy uses against believers is discouragement. He just tries you to, get, to get you to give up. But one of the greatest weapons he uses worldwide is he tries to get people offended at God. God wasn't there for me. If God is so good, then why do bad things happen? You know what we're really saying? We're saying, I'll decide if there's a God and what he's like. And if I don't like the way you describe him, then he's not, you know, I won't accept that. How bizarre is that? If there is a God, if he created all things, then how is it that I think I can just decide what he thinks? It, it's bizarre. It's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. This whole passage was designed to get us to stop and, and think how silly the reasoning is that we can just say God is this or God is that. We can just decide the characteristics of God and then think that God has to be that. It, it would be like if I went to the doctor and he told me I had cancer and he told me that it was, it was going to kill me. And I went home and just said, I, I don't want to die, so I don't believe cancer is going to kill me. Does cancer go away when I do that? Or, or let's suppose I got on the scale and it said 250 pounds, and I don't want to weigh 250 pounds. So I just say, no, oh, there's 32 ounces in a pound. Now I only weigh 125. <laughs> do I really only weigh 125? I can, I can redefine it. I can play games in my head, but I weigh what I weigh no matter how I mess things up in my head. We're so messed up in our heads, in our, in our world today, that people don't know if they're a boy or a girl. That used to be a very simple thing you could teach a kid. You know, the first thing they did when they got a puppy, is it a boy or a girl? Well, there's a little bit of birds and bees you teach them about there. You don't ask the pup, what do you think you are, a male or a female? The puppy doesn't get pregnant because he thought he was a, a female. If he's a, a male, he's not getting pregnant. But we bought into this thing that you can just decide. So I can say, I don't believe God would send anybody to hell. And suddenly you think you just dis decided God doesn't send people to hell. Well, who are you to decide that? And why should, why should anybody pay attention to what you think about God? Do you have any proof? Did you come? Did you die? Did you go in the grave for three days? Did you rise up from the dead? Did you go up into the heavens before everybody else? Did you send back comforter? Did you cause 3,000 people to speak in tongues and, and at one time on the day of Pentecost? What do you have? Did you raise the dead? Did you cause the lame to walk? Did you open blinded eyes? What, what kind of proof do you have? All most of us have is an opinion. And your opinion becomes idolatry if it doesn't match the Word of God, if it doesn't match what He says He is. So much of the world, including the religious world, they're living in idolatry. That, that's the problem with even who God is. One of the beautiful things about understanding that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, is that that's what God said. He said, there's nobody else beside me. But the Greeks and the Romans thought there was all kinds of gods. So if there's one God and he rules, and I come along as a little Greek or a little he, uh, Roman, even if I'm running the whole, half the world or most of the world, if I make this philosophy up, there's Zeus and there's, this, there's all these different gods, does that create Zeus? It's just because someone wrote about Zeus somewhere? Just because some, some brainiacs got together and invented these gods? Did that make those gods appear? Just because some people got together and said, God does not exist, does that poof make God not exist? That's ridiculous. The very fact that you can't say who he is is the best proof that he is God. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a God and decide what he likes and he doesn't like. 
We don't read the Bible and take the parts we want and get rid of the parts we don't want and say, you know, I, I don't want that kind of God, so that's not the way God is. It, it just won't work that way. It doesn't even make sense. I cannot concoct a God of my liking and poof, there he is. I, baptism. Why do we do baptism? I wouldn't have chose baptism. I don't know what getting dunked down in the water does. For, you know, it, it's like my brain is saying, how, how would that have to do? Uh, you know, why would you even do that? So I can get to reasoning and say, you know, baptism is not really important. Well, who am I to say that? Did God say, scramble over the side? Oh, Hanson said, don't baptize, so you don't have to baptize. No. That would make me God. God doesn't listen to the Supreme Court. God doesn't listen to any, he doesn't listen to the Pentecostals. He doesn't listen to the Catholics. God is God. He's up there declaring who he is, and he wants us to catch up with it, understand who he is. And he said, you can come be part of my family, but if you're going to be part of my family and be adopted, we're going to give you my last name. So I want you to get up in front of everybody and say, I want to take on the name of Jesus. I'm going to stand and confess that he's my, my father, and I, I want to be a part of his family. And, and really, then it starts making sense why God asks people to do that. But I can't just decide if I like baptism or not and throw it out. That would be stupid of me. I can't just decide tongues are not from God. He's the one that poured out His Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He's the one that did it again and again in the book of Acts. Uh, talking in tongues isn't something that I decided I wanted to do and then said everybody ought to do it. it, it it's what Scripture says happened. I'm just reading history. I'm just seeing what God did. Jesus said, go wait in Jerusalem and you're going to get power. So God, by His very nature must offend you. You don't have a choice. That's what makes him God. He's going to offend everybody at some time. Because everyone in this room has a human nature similar to Satan's human nature who wanted to make himself a God. And Satan, he, he came to Adam and Eve and said, Hey, hath God said, no, no, he just doesn't want you to be like him. And he planted that seed and said, you could be like God. So you have a new age movement that says, I am God, and God is within me. Doesn't even make sense. If you're God, and you're God, and you're God, and you're God, then gods are like mosquitoes. You know, <laughs> dime a dozen. You didn't create... If you're, if you're a God and you didn't create, well, you know, what's the difference in that one and that one? But if there's one true, sovereign, King of kings, Lord of God, Lord, Almighty, well, then there's some days that I'm going to be offended because he's going to want me to do some things I don't want to do. And that's what makes him God. I have a choice as to whether or not I want to embrace him and trust him and be a part of his kingdom forever and ever. But I can't choose. I can't sit here and decide what heaven's going to be like. I don't like streets of gold, so heaven's going to be streets of plutonium. I, I don't know. Ivory. I could write a book about that. I could start a religion about that. I could say I found tablets buried in the ground made of gold that say that. But if God didn't say that, I'm as silly as the guy who burned half the tree and made a God out of the other half of the tree. God, do I trust you? Can I really say, in God we trust? If not, I'm probably discovering why I don't have confidence and why I don't have peace and why I don't have joy. Because if I can decide what's right and wrong, there's nothing to hang on to. If I can say it's okay to kill babies in the womb, well, then I could say it's okay to kill babies when they're halfway out of the womb. And then I could say it's okay to take parts of those babies and sell them off. And after a while, 
we can make up rules that are far out there and we're no better than cannibal civilizations. We're no better than Hitler and what he did. Because they had good reasons. They had books written about why they were the master race. They had thought it all through. They, their idolatry was their, their race. And in their minds, they had dethroned the real God, made their own God, and created havoc in the world. So if your preacher is preaching to you about the real God, he's going to offend you sometimes. Not because he's mean, but because he's being honest with you. Now God, being the good God that he is, even if you don't think he's good, being the good God that he is, he goes to great lengths to develop our trust in him because if we can really let him be God, obey and trust him, it takes us into a realm of living that you can't get to any other way. You don't get into this place of peace by smoking a joint. That just messes with your brain cells and freaks you out and makes you think you're at peace. You don't, you don't get into a place of peace by drinking yourself silly. That's just, again, that's an idolatry of sorts. You get into peace when you stop fighting with God and you start listening to what he says and you embrace what he says and you do what he says. And it's not bondage at all. It's stepping into this place of freedom. It's stepping into a place of peace. It's stepping into a place of joy. But more people can be easily drawn into idolatry than true God worship, as you can see by reading the Old Testament. His very own people had that trouble. And I have that trouble. And you have that trouble. God is good. Amen. Yeah. And God answers prayer. Amen. Yeah. But he's my heavenly father. He's a good parent. If you're a good parent, you may answer your child's request. But if you answer your child's every request, you're not a good parent. I should have had more amens from the parents that time. <laughs> My wife and I had the privilege of babysitting Hannah last week. Hannah is a little miracle girl. Uh, if you don't know the story, you can ask Tim and Michelle about it. But she came over and she's just, you know, uh, uh, we're kind of like grandparents and saying, that's the smartest kid there is around, you know. And she, she's, she can't talk yet, but she's got a bag. And she knows what's in that bag. She'll go over there and take it out. And she knows you need to take this apart. And then she'll go back and, and uh, she's just got a bag of goodies. And she knows she didn't earn that bag. She's got a bag because she's got loving parents that are taking care of her. She could close her eyes and say there are no parents, but her parents would still be there. She could get mad because there's not Twinkies in that bag. And say, my parents are not good because there's not Twinkies in this bag. But she'd be wrong. So, we don't earn anything that God gives to us. God is good. Sometimes he's so good he doesn't answer our prayers the way we like. Sometimes he does what's in our best interest, even though we don't know it's in our best interest. Sometimes he stops giving us the bottle and our relationship with him changes. And we wonder, what a mean, mean daddy. He doesn't give me the bottle anymore. Sometimes he'll take the blankie. Because it really doesn't look good on your first day of work to go in with your little blankie. So the Heavenly Father weans. God will do that because he's a good Heavenly Father. He'll maybe make you eat veggies. He may make you go to bed when you don't think it's time to go to bed. That's what a good parent does. And if our God can't say those kind of things to us, then we don't have much of a God. And America traded in for an imaginary God a long time ago. So we took him out of our schools. We said we don't want to pray to him. We say it can't be in the marketplace. So now there are terrorists in the marketplace. And now there are people who go into cinemas and shoot people and there are people who go into 
little kids' classrooms and massacre them because we opted for idolatry. It was too rigid and prudish and closed-minded and fundamentalist to believe that disrespecting parents is wrong and stealing is wrong and adultery is wrong and idolatry is wrong. So we changed who God was and we said He doesn't care if you do those things. And God is a loving God. He wouldn't, he wouldn't send anybody to hell. So we did something so foolish as it'd be much like saying to your three-year-old, the cars in the street won't hurt you. Because you, you don't want to think about how horrible it would be for a child to be run over. What do you do? Do you, do you tell them, don't go in the street? Or do you tell them a lie and say, it, it won't hurt you? God won't send anybody to hell. What, did you tear out half the Bible? I, I'm not mad. I don't want to send people to hell. But, you know, the meanest thing we could ever do is tell them a lie about God. So, I just want to read another passage to help those of you who are believers realize how can you really have confidence and trust when God's letting you go through things that you don't want to be going through right now. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 3. Again, it's a lengthy passage, so I'm not going to stop and uh, analyze it. I'll let you do that in your mind. Paul's saying, for the rest, my brethren, delight yourselves in the Lord and continue to rejoice that you're in Him. To keep writing to you over and over the same things is not, an ir it's not irksome to me, and it's a precaution for your safety. Look out for those dogs, Judaizers, legalists. Look out for those mischief makers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. What he's talking about is there's a whole group of people who are trying to teach people to go to heaven by good works instead of by grace. This is what I want to get to. For we're Christians... Excuse me. For we Christians are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and by the spirit of God and exult and glory and pride ourselves in Jesus Christ and put no confidence or dependence on what we are. Would you say that with me? And put no confidence or dependence on what we are in the flesh and in outward privileges and physical advantages and external appearances. Though for myself... I have at least grounds to rely on the flesh. If any other man considers that he has or seems to have reason to rely on flesh and his physical and outward advantages, I still have more. I have still more. Circumcised when I was eight days old of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, and the son of Hebrews. As to the observance of the law, I was of the party of the Pharisees. As to my zeal, I was persecutor of the church, and by the law standard of righteousness, supposed justice, uprightness, and right standing with God, I was proven to be blameless and no fault was found in me. Pretty good guy, huh? But whatever former things I had and it might have been gains to me, I have come to consider as one combined loss for Christ's sake. Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possessions, possession of a priceless privilege the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth, the supreme advantage of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, and of progressively, everyone say progressively, becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with Him, of perceiving and recognizing and understanding Him more fully and clearly. For His sake, I have lost everything and considered all to be mere rubbish, refuge, refuse, regs, in order that I may win, gain Christ, the anointed one, and that I may actually be found and known as in him, not having any self-achieved righteousness that can be called my own based on my obedience to God's laws, demands, ritualistic uprightness, and supposed right standing with God thus acquired, but possessing that genuine righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the anointed one, the truly right standing with God which comes by excuse me, comes from God by saving faith. For my determined purpose, this is what Paul did, is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way continue to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which 
it exerts over believers, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into the, his likeness, even to his death, in the hope that, if possible, I might attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while in the body. This is important. Not that I have attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of, grasp, and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do, this is toward the end of his life, it's one, my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling me upward. Lots of sermons in there. But one thing we can learn from that is you never get there. I trusted him yesterday. I have a new set of things to trust him for today. I have the same opportunity to be an idolater today as I had 40 years ago. After he helps me over the Red Sea, I wonder if he can help me through the desert. If I make it through the desert, I wonder if he can help me over the Jordan River. If I can go over the Jordan River, I wonder if he can take down Jericho. If I, if I come to Ai and have a setback, I wonder if he left me altogether. That's what humans do. And that's why they go after idolatry. That's why a nation that God did all those wonderful things for would turn again and again to idolatry. And so do Pentecostals. And so do I. Only those who can still say, in God we trust, after life has knocked them down, really know the joy, the peace, and the confidence that I'm teaching about. In his book, Hymns Stories, Al Smith wrote about one of my favorite songs. A man by the name of Charles Weigel spent much of his time as an itinerant evangelist. and It wasn't an easy life, he said. It was a rewarding one, but it was hard. And, and Al Smith said he met Mr. Weigel on the campus of Tennessee Temple University in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He said, I'd often sung his songs, and I now had a chance to ask him how he had been led to write, especially this favorite hymn that I'm so fond of. He said, I felt there had to be something special connected to its writing because it had had such an impact in the world. And here's the story that Uncle Charlie told him. Uncle Charlie said, I'd been actively involved in evangelistic work for quite a few years, and uh, to some, it may have seemed like a life of sacrifice, but to me, the reward of seeing souls saved was worth more than money. He said, in all this, I thought that I had the support of my wife, but somewhere along the way, she began to be influenced by some relatives who didn't care about the Lord, didn't understand the calling of God. And one day, I went home and I found a note waiting for me. It said, Charlie, I've been a fool I've done a lot of things long enough. From here on out, I'm getting all I can out of what the world owes me. I know you'll continue to be a fool for Jesus, but for me, it's goodbye. Now, if you've ever been abandoned, you know that's probably one of the most painful things that can happen to you in life. And as Uncle Charlie told Al Smith this story, his eyes began to fill with tears, and he said, the bottom of my world seemed to fall out at that moment. I loved my wife very much. I went and found her. I, I tried to reason with her not to go through with her plans, but to no avail. He said, later I was sitting on the porch of a cottage in Florida overlooking a lake. I felt so depressed and forsaken that I thought, you know, why not just end it all and walk right off the end of this pier? Nobody will care anyway. Your work's finished. He said, but through the appalling gloom of that moment, there seemed to be a flash, a voice to my soul that said, Charlie, I haven't forgotten you. Charlie, I care for you. Let not your heart be troubled. He said, I threw myself down beside the chair and I asked the Lord to forgive me for not fully 
trusting Him. And I promise that come what may, from now on, I would never again let such a thought cross my mind. He said, I began serving the Lord. It wasn't very easy because a lot of people didn't understand the situation. They were reluctant to use Him. But slowly the Lord began to heal that hurt. and Soon He was busy for God again. And then one day, he received the sad news that his wife had died under some very heartbreaking and tragic circumstances. She had had less than five years to go try the world, and eternity began for her. He said, I wondered what did the future have for me. And while he was thinking on the goodness of the love of Jesus and how he'd never forsaken him, he had this desire to write a song, and that song would be the summation, he said, of his entire life. It was a story the whole world needed to know, he said. And then Al Smith said, Uncle Charlie, was it worth it all to go through the heartache and the heartbreak? He said, don't you often wish that it had never happened? Mr. Smith said, I'll never forget his reply. He said, it's not for me to question the testings of the Lord, no matter how hard they may seem to be. God, in His love, knows what's best, and someday He'll tell me why it all happened. Till then, I'm just going to go on singing and telling the world what He told them in this song that I'm going to sing, and if you know it, maybe you could join me. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely he did something that no other friend could do no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as He. No one else could take this sin and darkness from me. How much he cares me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his long and love arms around me. And he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take this sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much He cares for me. Every day He comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand His word of love but I'll never know just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above would you stand and sing it no one ever cared for me like Jesus there's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take this sin and darkness from me. Oh, how 
much He cares. Sing it one more time, would you? Cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as He. No one else could take this sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much He cares. Would you thank Him for a few minutes? God, I thank You for caring for me. I thank You that I can trust You, Jesus. I thank You that You're a Heavenly Father. That I don't need anything else to be confident in, Lord. I thank You for grace. I thank You for mercy. I thank You, Lord, for long-suffering and gentleness that You show toward me every day. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 I wonder if some of you might want to join me in the front for just a minute. I invite all of you because we're all subject to tendencies like I preached about here today. And I invite you to the altar because that's what they did in Scripture. They went to the altar to recommit to sacrifice because they knew that it wouldn't take but a week or a month and before you know it they're defining their own God and they're going after other gods and so it was very important to them to go to the temple or to the uh, a place to pray that's why the patriarchs built altars and I want to ask you as you come to this altar today can you honestly say in God I trust. If right now you're a little miffed at God because He didn't do what you asked Him to do, then you don't trust Him. And I've been there. And I have to decide right there, am, am I going to trust my prayers and what I think needs to happen in my life? Or am I going to trust the guy who made it all? It's a no-brainer. But the distance from here to here is like interminable. I'm not asking you if God is the one you say you trust. I'm asking you, when you need guidance in your life, who do you go consult? Do you consult the medium? Do you consult the intellectuals? Do you consult the philosophers? Or do you consult... The Almighty God. And more importantly, who do you obey? Do you go get counsel, godly counsel, and then go do your own thing because you didn't like what the godly counsel said? Because if you do that, you're an idolater. You don't really trust Him. Who do you run for when you need comfort? Do you call your best friend? Well, it's okay to have a best friend, but if you call your best friend first, if you try to draw your strength from your spouse or your best friend or your time in the woods, you're an idolater. If you run to Jesus, tell him all about your troubles. He will hear your faintest cry. He will answer by and by. There's a couple things in your life that will be very telling as to whether you're a believer or an idolater. One of them is your checkbook. I trust God so much, I'm going to hang on to everything. Because I can't give Him this. After all, He has all the money He already needs. Even though He asked me to give it to Him. He said, bring me your first fruits. He said, I want you, every time you get anything, I want you to come to me first and say, I want to remember who gave this to me, so I'm going to give you the first 10% of it. I give this to you as an expression and to hold myself accountable. He is my God. Money is not my God. My next paycheck is not my God. A better job is not my God. I take it to Him and I remind myself. 
I may be rich, I may be poor, but I, I have a God and I trust Him. The other thing that will be very telling is your calendar. I trust God, but I don't have time to go worship Him. I believe God is Almighty. He's going to live forever. He's going to reign the universe, but I don't have time on Sunday for Him. And I don't really have time in the middle of the week. And, and when they call those special prayer meetings on top of that, that's, that's like my third time that week to go talk to Almighty God. Doesn't He know I'm busy? I'm saving the world. I'm saving my family. I have to work. I work 80 hours a week. And I don't have two hours for God. What is your idol? IBM, Ford, whatever you're working for. You, you'll fall over yourself to get a, a raise. You'll do everything. You'll go, to the, you'll go to the boss's dinner and be miserable with his wife. They're nagging and going on and all their silliness, and you'll put yourself through all kinds of misery, but you won't come into the presence of Almighty God for a few hours because, you know, when the boss calls, i got to go, but when God calls, oh, he's nice and he, he doesn't care. Have you read the Scripture? I'm a jealous God. Thing is, you bought into the boss because he lives here. He signs your checks, and God's he's invisible. You can't see him, so... He's easy to push out of your mind. and So it's very easy to not be a true believer. See, God wants me to trust Him because that's the way He designed it. Brent just put up a video uh, montage of a, a, a series of things that were said by a, a man who was talking about how it's how we were designed that's important. God designed us to be loved by Him. God designed us to know who we are. God designed us to live without sin, free from sin. I don't quit sinning because God doesn't want me to have any fun. I quit sinning because God says there's a better way to do things. I don't want you eating Twinkies. I want you eating veggies. And when I trust God enough to go eat my veggies, suddenly my health gets better. You are being invited into a wonderful world of trust. But God designed it to where the only way to get there is to completely, wholeheartedly, 100%, leave family behind. He said, you have to love me so much, it's almost like in comparison you hate your family. He's not saying hate your family. He's saying the world has to become so distant, dim. And I have to become everything in order for you to go into that place with me that I'm calling you to. So you want more peace, you want more confidence, you want more rest, you want less worry, you want less struggle. I'm telling you, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. Now in a room like this, there's a dozen different places people are at. There are people here today who have no relationship with God. There are people here who had a relationship and they've drifted off into idolatry. There's people here that you've never been more in love with God and you're, you're more in His court than you've ever been in your life. But we all need to ask ourselves, do I trust Him? If you've been lonely lately, you have a choice. Do I look for, do I go to the dating site or do I go to prayer? Do I compromise my faith because that girl really likes me. She doesn't believe in God. She does some things that God really doesn't want me to do. But boy, she sure kisses good. And I sure feel a lot of hormones flowing with her. And so I think I'll go with her. Idolatry. Isn't it kind of silly to trust in a 20-year-old or 25-year-old girl who's just a human being like you instead of the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth? If you found yourself lately, even believers in this room, if you found yourself praying less and taking more sleeping medication, God's probably saying to you, look, I'm just trying to help you here. You're not really trusting me. I'm, I'm beckoning you. I'm not condemning you because you're doing those things, but really that's idolatry. Don't, don't, go, to your, don't go to that for answers. Come to me. 
Sometimes God will absolutely let the rug be pulled out from underneath you. He, he wants you to move into this place of trust so badly that He will risk losing you completely by letting the rug be pulled out from uh, People tell the story. Dennis tells the story about how he almost got killed twice in a day. And finally, he turned to God. Bob talks about being on the, the base and, and finding a track in a phone booth and just being overwhelmed. He was at the bottom of the bottom and, and, and just overwhelmed. The rug got pulled out from underneath him. And he, he started calling out to God again. Sometimes... A, a, a heavenly father lets things like that come into your life to knock you out of idolatry and back into being a believer. I, I'm, I'm talking to some people here. Some of you may be very mature in God. Some of you might be brand new in God. But don't be offended at God. The enemy is going to try to get you mad at him. The enemy is going to try to get you to define your own God. I'm telling you, there's nothing like our God, the, the true living God. I don't mean the made up God. I don't mean the God that America's made up. I don't mean the God that many religions have made up. I mean the one true living God who defined himself in the word of God. Here's a few tips. Living for God is like skydiving. You can't do it halfway. They're like jumping out of the plane and grabbing onto the plane. It, it just doesn't work. It'd probably kill you. It'd start flopping you up against the... You, 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 you couldn't live through that. Tip number two, you're... The, the way you're put together, your humanity, your selfishness is going to fight you tooth and nail every second. Your selfishness has been empowered by our culture. Our culture said, whatever you think to do, do it. Whatever you believe is right. The, your selfishness have been, has been empowered. And so nowadays, it's almost considered hate speech for someone like me to get up and tell you the truth. Tip number three, everybody in here tends toward idolatry. And most of the world will take a different path. You'll be all by yourself going up the, the mountain to pray like Moses. And you'll be in the very presence of God so much so that your face will shine with God's glory. And all of God's people will be down worshiping the golden calf because idolatry is so much easier than true faith. So, I challenge you to trust Him today. Trust isn't just a one-time confession, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a relationship. It's a way of life. I have to trust Him enough to, to turn around, to repent of the way. Repent means turn around. Instead of living for my flesh, I live for Him. I have to believe Him enough to get in front of everybody else and say, I'm going to put my trust in Jesus Christ and I'm going to take His name on me in baptism. I have to believe him enough to, to open up vulnerable, like Brother Ford said today, and let his spirit overwhelm me so much so that I'm no longer in control. A lot of people have trouble being filled with the spirit because it, it's no longer me. I'm not in control. That's scary. I've got to love him enough to worship him when my, my life's path takes a turn that I don't like. When somebody near me dies, even though I prayed. When my country takes a bad turn, even though I prayed. When somebody that I really tried to help turns around and speaks evil against me. He's still good. He's still just. He's still right. So I don't know what you need to pray. I can't make you be honest. But I've given, I've, I've knocked around bad reasoning. I've come against your flesh today. I've done enough to make everyone in this room mad if you wanted to be mad because I'm trying to help you move from whatever it is that God's trying to get you to let go of into a deeper place so you can sing nobody ever cared for me like Jesus. If you don't have that sentiment today, if you're a little miffed at him, could you pray? If you haven't committed your life to him, would you pray? Let's all pray. God, I pray right now for everyone in this room. I pray, Lord, that they would be able to trust you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we would see plainly, that we would not buy into the lies of our culture. That we would not believe the silliness of creating a God in our own image. That we would not redefine who you are and then expect you to be who we redefine you to be. But that we would look hard and long at this and we would trust you.
We would trust you alone, Jesus. I love you, God. I need you, Jesus. I praise you, God. I, I live for you alone. I long for you alone. I desire you alone. I tell out of the highest. There's no other friend so kind as he. Make your peace with him and let that spirit flow. Quit struggling and let there be peace. Whatever you want, God. I'm not going to fight you anymore, Lord. I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to try to make you do something I want you to do. Would you sing it a couple more times? No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as He. No one else could take this sin and darkness from No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Oh, there's no other friend so kind as He. No one else could take this sin and darkness from me. One thought before we leave, just to comfort you, if you felt convicted that God's best have been in the same boat, I remind you of Elijah who stood on Mount Carmel and called fire down from heaven. He was having a great day, but then he got word that Jezebel wanted to kill him and he went to the wilderness and he told God, I don't like what's happening in my life. I just soon you kill me. He became completely suicidal, the man of God. And God had to come along and say, you know what, Elijah, you're going to have to be okay that I don't kill Jezebel right now. She has her day coming. You have to be okay that, that you feel all alone because I have a lot of people, they're just not with you right now. You don't feel the comfort, but you're just going to have to be okay with how I'm using you. He couldn't explain to Elijah that thousands of years later, you and I would draw strength from Elijah's story. Elijah had no clue what God was doing with his life. Nobody knows like Jesus. 